name for Chris? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's turn to number 761. 761, where he leads, I'll follow. We'll sing the first and third verse of this. We'll have a prayer, and then we'll go to class. And thank you for being here. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Dear Father. study it. We pray, dear Lord, that you be with the teachers who have studied it and are teaching it. That you be with those who are listening and that, that we might open our hearts and our minds and our souls, dear Lord, and, and eat the precious bread that you have given us. We pray that you forgive us of our sins. We pray, dear Lord, that you be with all the sick and afflicted. Watch over us and be with us during this, during this uh, worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Exodus chapter 20. As you're making your way there, I need to fix the bulletin. I still got it messed up on the on the work night for the for the bears. Tuesday is correct. Hey, can I get you to move over a bit? The podium and you. Something Tuesday is correct, but the 26th is I don't think it is. I think it's the 24th. And then the Saturday men's breakfast is not the 26th either. It's the 28th. So go for the week, day of the week, and not the day. Uh, but the, the ladies are, or anyone who wants to work with the Bears is going to meet on Tuesday evening. It is the 24th, right? Yes. yes. And uh, we've got a speaker comments going to share with us the. Uh, uh, the success that we've had with the Bears and how, what a good work that has turned out to be. And then the men's breakfast in Mount Vernon is the last Saturday of the month, which is the 28th, starting at 8 o'clock. So, so we're, we're going to have about 500 Bears. 
about 500 bears to stuff. So if we have 500 people, that's just one bear each. <laughs> so uh, it, it'll be a, be a fun night. So be sure to try to come be a part of that. Are there others? Righteous Father, we come before you again this morning with thankfulness in our hearts for the night's rest, the dawning of a day, the blessings that's ours, the goodness you've seen fit to send her away. We ask that you will be with us this morning in our study, that we will be able to glean a little bit of insight that will help us uh, uh, be more devoted and dedicated in serving you and have a better appreciation for the care and the love that you have for us. Bless us in our efforts. Forgive us of our failures. Continue to love us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this has not been a real good morning so far. I cannot keep up with my stuff. I don't know where my clicker is. Uh, I guess I took it back there. <laughs> We're in the process of studying the Ten Commandments. A couple of things I want to mention to you as a matter of re review. This is not Exodus chapter 20, the writing of the Ten Commandments. This is when God verbally spoke the Ten Commandments. And recall back in chapter 19, the, the, the stage was being set. Moses had given the instructions to tell the nation of Israel to gather around the base of the mountain, spend three days in preparing, change your clothes, clean yourself up, come to the base of the mountain in preparation for the God in heaven to speak. Do not touch the mountain. If you go beyond the barriers that's been set, whatever they were, you will die. And we commented then when we went through that, if, what if somebody accidentally fell and touched that? What are there going to be the consequences? Well, they should die. And that sort of uh, uh, the idea you, you, you make a promise, you fulfill that promise. We talked about how parents need to do that. If parents talk to their children and make a tell the children if you do this or that and they do this or that, then they should be punished. Well, God set the standard for them to come, and while they were there, cloud covered the mountain, lightning, thundering, all kinds of natural phenomena was taking place, and then there was the voice of God, and the people feared. And God basically said, Moses, come up to the mountain. That's all he said. So Moses went back up to the mountain and we commented that's about 7,500 feet in elevation. That's not just a little height. It took some effort to get to the top of the mountain. And when he was there, basically God said, I want you to go back down and prepare the people. And the people said they would follow God. They said they would keep His commandments. They had, uh, said that they would do what Moses asked them to do. So you come back down the mountain, chapter number 20. There at the base of the mountain, God speaks again. And a similar situation, if you run your finger down a little further into this chapter, uh, verse 18, the people, they saw the thunders, they saw the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoked, it was covered with smoke, and, and, and the people, they saw it, and they removed, and they stood afar off. They said to Moses, speak with us, we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we do. Same environment, and the people were still afraid and basically said, Moses, we don't want to hear from God. We'll listen to you. But when God speaks, it's too unnerving. They were fearful 
too much and that they didn't want to handle that. So you go back to chapter number one, verse number one. God is in this city, mountain covered with smoke, lightning, thunder, this trumpet. Chapter 19, that trumpet just got louder and louder and louder with the same scenario and God speaks out. And He begins by telling these people who He was. He begins by reminding them that He was the Lord. He was the God that brought them out of the nation of Israel. I mean out of Egypt. He was the God that had been caring for them. And we made a comment as we went through this, just for review. These commandments that God is ready to give them were not commandments for the world. They were not commandments for all men. They were commandments for this specific group of people. Never have we been obligated to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, with that said, I want to show you those commandments are repeated in the law of Christ. We keep them not because they was given to uh, God to these Israelites. We keep them because Jesus tells us to keep them. And I understand the font's a little bit small, it may be hard to read. But here are the ten that's found in the New Testament. Notice, if you will, most of them are found, or a lot of them, let's see, I don't think any of the first ones are, but there's about seven or eight of them found in Romans chapter 13, verses 9 and verse 10. That's the first five. Go to the next five. And they're found in the New Testament as well. Except number four. Number four is not found in your New Testament in principle. We do not keep the Sabbath. We do not honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath was something given to this nation of Israel. It was to remember their deliverance from Egypt. What day do we consider to be a holy day? First day of the week. Right? First day of the... The church came together on the first day of the week to break bread. The church came together and they gathered up a collection on the first day of the week. Jesus was resurrected from the grave on the first day of the week. And so first day of the week is what we would call today the Lord's Day in Revelation. And in a sense, every day is the Lord's Day. But the first day of the week is a specific time. Not the Sabbath. But all the other nine are found in, in, the, in the New Testament. And if you want a copy of these, this chart, I can give it to you. Pat, over here trying to write all that down. I, I, I can get this stuff, information to you. But if we went through the Ten Commandments, the first one, no other God before me. Closely related is commandment number two. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Uh, I did a little digging on that this week. I got another slide I want to show you. What I want to show you is the Ten Commandments over in the little gray block. And the Ten Commandments that were put, uh, put out by the Catholic Church is in the little blue box. Do you see any difference? Look at commandment number two. In the gray box, what we've given here in our scriptures, commandment number two, thou shalt not make any graven images. Catholics took that out. They skipped it. That doesn't fit all the images they have in all their fancy and elaborate buildings. Doesn't fit the image of Mary. And all the other things that they have. They took it away. But, to make ten commandments, what they did, look at the last five. 
they divided the tenth commandment into two. Tenth commandment says, Thou shalt not covet. And it goes on and talks about your neighbor's wife and, not, and their possessions and so forth. They divided that into two commandments so that they still have a total of ten. Interesting, isn't it? People do that. They find areas in God's world they don't like, they don't agree. They try to alter it and change it to, to fit what they want it to say. Number three. That's all I got on the PowerPoint before his class goes. Any questions or comments? Um, all right. You know, if you don't do the end of study, like you said, I mean, you would you would just pass that off. I mean, you could just quickly look at 10, 10. Yeah. You know, without. Wow. It's hilarious. It's the same story that you've been teaching us. It, people just change it to suit themselves. Yeah. Well, I went across the thing about the Catholic. I was doing a, uh, in Adam Clark's commentary. He made mention of that, and I started digging a little bit, and, and I retyped it to make it fit PowerPoint, but they had little plaques, and, and commandment number two was had been deleted from the little plaques that they... They put out. Yeah. The third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This was a real problem they had back in the time of this writing in the keeping of keeping their oaths, keeping their, their, their commitment, their promises. People tend to break their promises and they would make, make a promise in the name of God and they violate that so they're necessarily taking God's name in vain. And uh, that was a, a real issue then. It's even a problem today. People don't keep their word. But there's several ways you can take God's name in vain. One of the ways is through profanity. Use it in a frivolous, blasphemy way. Use it in an unreverent way. And I mentioned this before, and I, it still bothers me. I see people all the time. They just use the name Jesus Christ. Or, oh my God. And, and just in a conversation, and without even realizing what they're saying. And that's wrong. That's wrong. And Moses is telling these people through, or God is telling them rather directly, do not do that. We need to give honor and respect to God's name. You remember Jesus teaching His disciples how to pray? And He begins that prayer, Matthew chapter 6, Our Father, hallowed be Thy name. What does that mean? People of the Old Testament or in the New Testament, the scribes, they had so much reverence for God and His name. They would be writing and transcribing along and they'd come to the word Yahweh or Jehovah. They would lay their pen or the quill down, get another pen never been used, write the word and discard that pen never to be used again. They at least they had a lot of flaws, but they respected the name of God. And sad to say, our culture today doesn't. We know. We just use it just like any other word, without any consequences or thinking about the consequences of what we're saying. Profanity. In a sense, you can take the Lord's name in vain by the way you live. We claim to be Christians. That's wearing the name of the Lord. If we live a life of hypocrisy, that's shaming or using the Lord's name, in, in essence, by your example in a, in, a, in a vain way. God expects His name 
to be honored. Honored. At the end of verse number, uh, wherever we are here, I guess number six, number seven, the end of that verse says those that use his name frivolously will not be forgotten. It said the Lord will hold him or will not hold him guiltless that taketh the name in vain. If he doesn't hold you guiltless, that means you're being held guiltless. You will be, you will be judged guilty. Guilty of the way you use the name of God Almighty. Now this is for those Israelites, but I just showed you some passages in principle that applies to us today in the law of Christ. Your comments. There's other words that people use referencing. Do what? There's other words that people use referencing uh, uh, spirituality too. And one of the words is holy. Chris, can you click me up too? They use the word holy and put it, uh, yep. a, re a reverent word behind it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, pretty much the same thing. Pretty much. Well, it's going to go back. I can't get it to move. Next commandment. The fourth. Remember the Sabbath. Not only do you remember it, but you honor it. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The Sabbath was introduced to us back in Exodus 16. This is not something new. Flash back to Exodus 16. We've got the children of Israel there. They've been given the instructions. Go out and gather the manna. It's collect a certain amount of manna every day of the week. Except on the day before the Sabbath, you gather twice as much because he sets forth the principle on the Sabbath, you rest. You do no work on the Sabbath. And so they've already been introduced to this. But here we have God emphasizing and trying to just picture this in your mind, that, that sound echoing from that mountain. This is not the written stones yet. This is God verbalizing these commandments. Remember the Sabbath. And he goes on and tells them a little bit about, about the Sabbath. There's a couple things I want to point out as we look through this. One is they're not to do any work. And that applies to not only the Israelites, but their, their servants, even their livestock. It goes on to verse number, uh, number 10, They shall do no work. Thou, thy son, thy daughter, the maid servant, the uh, men servants, maid servants, nor the cattle, nor thy strangers that are within the gates. This is describing someone apparently pretty well off. Someone that may be a position of influence. They have maids and maid servants. They have livestock and they have uh, children. And if that would apply to these people, it would certainly apply down to most anyone else within the hierarchy. But in verse number 11, six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. If you go back to Exodus 16, you talk about the Sabbath, we're learning there that they gather up enough manna for a particular day to sustain them through a particular day. Here we talk about God creating the world in six days yeah, but resting on the seventh. My question is this. How long were those days? Reading this context, reading Exodus 16, where they go out and gather the stuff to take care of them on a particular day. How long were the
those days. And the reason I ask that is because there's people that want you to try to get you to believe that the creation was not a literal six 24-hour days. They say those days with God are God's days of a thousand years, a thousand years is the day with God. And so this creation one day may literally have been thousands and thousands and thousands of years. What they're trying to do is support evolution. And you got the they got what they call theistic evolution. Now the evolutionist doesn't really believe the Bible. But the theistic revolution is the guy that the Lord believes in the Bible but tries to dovetail the two together. So he says, okay, I believe that God created the world, but He didn't do it in a little 24 hours. He did it over a long period of time and called that period of time a day. What does this verse tell us? In six days, God created the world. He rested on the seventh day. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Go back to Exodus 16. That Sabbath was a literal 24 hour day in which the people lived. It was not some thousands and thousands of years. So Exodus 16 verse number 30 complements these verses here very well. Your thoughts? Sorry, my thought would be that they got up and done their chores every day like we do. So a day to them, in my mind, is sun sun. They have, it was a 24 hour period. They called it a bit different. We call it a day, even though it might be in the middle of the night. But they call it a day and a night. So a day and a night, those 12 hour days, from 6 to 6, from 6 to 6. So they're, we go from 12 to 12. Yeah. <coughs> But it's still a 24-hour period. Not thousands of years. Yes, sir? There was a... If you just think about it, when, when the flood came, uh, a lot of your scientists believe that for these layers, it takes 300 years to make, say, an inch of earth. But during the flood, the waters that came down, look at the Grand Canyon. Look at all the places around the world where there's so much water. They talk about all these dinosaurs with bones, 10,000 of one kind of animal within a heap and a pile of Denver River. Now, why was that? Yeah. But if you think about all the dirt that was stirred up during that flood, that water, the, the, all that water had to be really murky. And I'm sure it gave time for everything to die and settle. And then all that. Well, that sediment, sediment. That sediment went down in different layers. Yeah and stacked up so it looks like all these layers took so 300 years for each little inch and they got lots of layers. So I can see where they could get, think that, uh, well, it, it's eons ago and whatever the 65 million year thing they have, you can see where they're, where they're dead wrong on it. Yeah. Because the Bible says you know, that water came down from all directions it, that water had to have been muddy and murky, and it settled down in those 40 days. A lot of that stuff was buried. You know, it became, went away, and was buried by those sediments. And, and it, it's what it looks like to me. I mean, that's just without looking in the Scripture. Yeah. But if you read the Scripture, you see how all this happened, and it's pretty well self-explanatory. It, it, it supports it very well, does it? Yes. Yes, sir. If you go to the creations, it's up at Noah's Ark, where they built this. Yeah. yeah. Same guy that built Noah's Ark built the uh, creation's uh, li uh, uh, library. And this substantiates what he just said. It shows how it, how the uh, layers were layered, how the bones, how the, the uh, 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 dinosaurs and all the animals were there. And it all fits with the Bible. It don't fit with evolution. More and more evidence they find supports the Bible. The guy that put the right here was, was the, uh, he, he was a, 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 a scientist that they had in the Bible. He was the one that put the Bible in the Bible. And he, he, he took the Bible and built, and, and built the creations with the Bible. And, and, and his, his, his findings and everything 
showing that where all, all the layers and all the stuff that they found where evolution was tried to prove evolution, he proved it with the Bible that where it, uh, everything that, was, was, that they found was within the Bible uh, uh, standards. Yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You read in Genesis about the creation. Yeah. It ends each sentence with and, and the beginning and the evening of each day. You know, there was evening and there was there was morning of each day. Yep. Yeah. So that kind of says it. So well, it, it does to us, but to those people that don't want to read it that way, yeah, they they can make an argument. But they can't argue with this passage is here. Well, I guess it's just like leaving the beginning and the ending of a day. Yep. And you think about the creation. You got the uh, plants. They were created on a particular day, but it wasn't until the next day that you had all the sunlight, the sun, and the moon, and so forth. Plants have to have sun to exist. So you couldn't have created these plants and had them to exist for thousands of years without sunlight. It, none of it just fits. Yes, sir? You stole it. Huh? <laughs> you just stole it. You but said that years say? ago and that stuck in my mind. I was going to re repeat what you just said. Oh, uh, okay. Stole your thunder. <laughs> Others? Well, the Sabbath. It was a sacred time, the time they set apart. It was the time uh, that they would remember. And it was a time that they were to rest. And we commented a few weeks ago that I, I think there's a principle there. We're not necessarily to honor and keep the Sabbath, but I think God expects us to spend some time to rest. And I'd like to see us as, as Christians on, on Sunday spend a time of Devoting ourselves to Him and serving Him and thinking about and meditating and, and reflecting on what God has done for us. I think that would certainly be appropriate within, uh, within the principle that's outlined in the Sabbath. But on the Sabbath, the, the Jewish people or the Israelites as they became Jews later on, they distorted all that. If you say, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, now what does that mean? How do you do that? And so they grabbed those words and they distorted it. And that was the biggest problem Jesus had with the Jews in His earthly ministry was the traditions that they brought in, particularly around the Sabbath. Jesus and His disciples got in trouble for eating some corn on the Sabbath. They said that's violating the Sabbath. <clears throat> they say if you, if you eat corn, then, 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 then you're reaping, and that's work. You're threshing, and you're winnowing, and you're preparing food. That's work. And you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. If you pick anything up with your right hand or your left hand, or you have anything across your chest like a strap to carry a backpack or something, that's work. Can't do that. You can't even tie a knot in a rope. Unless you were a woman, they'd allow you to tie the knot in your girdle. So they would grab all these things and, and, and attach so much to it that, that it, that it became more than the people could keep and became tradition. So you got Jesus, Matthew 15, talking about them trying to bind all this tradition and keeping the commandments of man. And he says, if you do that, that's vain worship. Verse number 9. All goes back to trying to keep the Sabbath. See, it doesn't give detail on what that means. So there's some judgments there. And they carried it to the extreme. Got two minutes. Final thoughts from you. We didn't get very far. Honor your father and the mother. We'll pick up there next week. Then it talks about kill. We'll talk about there's a difference between taking a life and murder, which is the word used for kill there. Then we talk about adultery. 
And I want you to think a little bit about adultery and, and, and what that means. And as we talk about adultery, I want to go off on a little tangent. And I want us to discuss homosexuality. That's closely related. But that is a problem that our society is facing. Homosexuality. Chris was telling me this morning about a friend of his he knew had a 14-year-old daughter. And the daughter has decided she is a lesbian. 14 years old. How does she know that? Was she born that way? Is it genetic? Was she taught that? Why? And what's God's view on homosexuality? So I want to spend, so you might do a little digging on that on your own between now and next week. Final thoughts from you. What about working on Sunday? Sir? What about working on Sunday? What about working on Sunday? Scripturally, I don't see that it violates any scripture. Uh, I would like to suggest that we spend the day, though, more in reverence. But if you, if, if, as long as that work doesn't interfere, you're, I'm assuming you're talking about you come to worship and everything, and you go back home and, and get on your shredder and start more in your passion. Something like that, right? Well, some jobs, you, you can't go to church. If you have a job that interferes with you uh, uh, attending services and forsaking the assembly, if it's a continual effort, I, I think I would consider changing jobs. At least look at something different. Because you're putting that before, putting that before God. And that job, and that becomes an idol. Before we to break, go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, I think it's verse number 5. I mentioned that last week and I couldn't pull the verse up. I want to go back and re rehash that. There are some things mentioned there as idolatry. We talked about idols last week. The things they mentioned there are some lifestyle that we have. And it says, mortify your body or put to death these things. Let me get over there. Verse number 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection. That's a, a strong affections, I guess. Evil concupiscence, that's the strong desires. Covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. Idolatry. See, those aren't waving images. But those are emotions that will take the soul of a person and cause that person to quit honoring and, and obeying God. This idea of covetousness. See, that would cover working on Sunday. Because that would include trying to make money to the point that you put that in front of serving God. That is idolatry. And so Colossians chapter 3, beginning of verse 5, is a good verse to support that idea of adultery. Others? Larry, I think a lot of this, uh, like the talk about this 14-year-old girl, I think a lot of this uh, belief is because they've never, they've they've never been around. They, they've never experienced life. They don't know the, anything about the Bible or God or anything. Yeah. Never been taught. Yeah, they've never grown up around any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like you lay with fleas, you get fleas. Yeah. So how does a 14 year old girl know that? Others? Alright, thank you for your comments. We'll carry on next week. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yesterday, Betty was in, in Roar City and she had a car wreck. She's okay. She's at home. She's just super sore. Um, okay. That's Betty, your sister? And so that might be why she's not here today. So. Glad you're not hurt. Yeah. That's what I thought her. Everything can be replaced. That hurt. Tell her to the messages for Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the big middle of the party. Yeah. I know. Check me and say that to you. Check your messages. Okay. I want to finish reading that for Okay. Hey, Chuck. 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 Hey,
Come on. What are we 